Good morning, church. Good morning to everyone watching online. It's great to have uh, everybody together this morning. Um, Last week, we we started a new sermon series called One Page Wonders, and you guys did such a good job with the one hit thing. Now, I'm going to give you another shot. So here we go. Are you ready? Bruce Chanel, 1961. Runaway. Runaway. Eh. Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, baby. You got it? Tell him what she won, Johnny. <laughs> hey, baby. All right, here we go. Round two. Norman Greenbaum, 1970. Sp- see, I told you guys are awesome. Spirit in the sky. It's where I'm going to go when I die. Yeah, all right. Uh, Anita Ward, 1979. Oh, yeah. Anita Ward, 1979. You can ring my bell. (laughs) There it is. All right, good, good. I'm glad I got one to stump you. That's awesome. Today's one-page wonder, as we look at just the the books of the Bible that are only a page, uh, we're going to look at 2 John, and it is found in the New Testament just before, right towards the end, actually, uh, right before Revelation, there's three one-page wonders right there, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude, Uh, and so we're looking at 2 John today. Obviously, it's written by... John, John the Apostle. John, this is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John, Revelation, and then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And um, if, you re- if you remember last summer, we did a series on 1st John, and you, as we read 1st John, you have to remember, he, he's not an engineer, I don't think. He's more of a poet. So he kind of writes in this sing-songy kind of way. Do you remember this? You know, uh, you, you'll see it when, as we get into it for sure. But you just need to, to, to hang in there a little bit because sometimes it sounds like he's repeating himself. And you're like, you just said that. Um, hang in there. He's just kind of singing his song. So uh, these 13 verses don't let the size fool you, though. Because this thing packs a a, a heck of a punch. Let me give you the context of of what's happening. It's the first century, towards probably the end of the first century. um, And the gospel is being spread through traveling preachers and itinerant uh, preachers. They go from church to church and they preach the the gospel. Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, they preach, that's for sure, and they teach, but uh, you know, you're not really sure uh, if, if what you're hearing uh, might, it might be incorrect. So unless uh, you know, you're being sent by, let's say, Paul, who sends Timothy and Titus, and then last week we saw Tychicus, they would show up with a message or they would show up uh, with a letter, maybe even to lead a church for a while. Um, uh, you, you might not know, okay, so what's this guy all about? What's, what's this woman preaching? And so uh, the churches in that time, they would invite this preacher into their home, give them uh, all kinds of hospitality, let them stay, all that kind of stuff. And, and mostly as these itinerants went around, that was a good thing because Roman inns were notorious for being uh, unsafe and pretty nasty. But you can imagine the problems that arise when you're not sure if what they're saying is the truth. Um, You know, some may talk about Jesus, but then maybe deny some important things, some truths about who Jesus is, or maybe they want to add on to uh, things that that, uh, were untrue. Um, In fact, you know, most of the books in the New Testament, except for the Gospels, uh, most of them are written to correct false teaching in the church. So there was plenty of false teaching going on. Now, as they write this, and as John writes this here, uh, one of the things that I think you need to, uh, I think we, we got to start with, is uh, we need to understand that to correct false teaching, you first have to acknowledge that there is teaching that is false. Okay, good. There is teaching that is true, and there is teaching that is false. Not everyone's opinion or belief is true. See where this is going. See, the problem is, uh, in, in our culture, uh, even today, uh, you know, believes that everyone is entitled to their truth. Everyone can have their own truth as long as someone is sincere 
or passionate about what they believe, then we should accept that. After all, accepting them, accepting their truth, is the loving thing to do, right? That's what the culture teaches. That's what we need to understand. John is writing to a church that's caught in a situation similar to ours. You know? How do you love and walk in the truth? How do you know what truth is? Is, love, is it love to accept things that are, are not true? I can tell you that John's letter is going to be tough for, for many to hear. I imagine it was hard for the church that first received this letter. It was hard for them to hear. But hard doesn't make it any less true or any less loving. So let's listen in and see why these 13 verses made the book. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the spirit of truth that is in us. We ask that, that uh, even now you would bring your word to life that it would produce a crop 30, 60, 100 fold in each one of us. Lead us, guide us, and help us to, to, to seek you and, and to love like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's what John writes. Verse, verse 1 through 3 is the introduction. He says, The elder, which is John, to the chosen lady and her children, which would be the church. Doesn't specify which one. I imagine this letter made the rounds just like a lot of the letters uh, did. It appeared to more than one church. To the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Now, that's just the opening. You see how it kind of does this sing-songy kind of thing? See, I'm not crazy. As far as you know. Yeah. John here, he uses the word truth four times in just his greeting. So clearly, truth is important. And John wants us to get, his, wants us to get a few things about truth uh, from the start. The first thing that he wants us to get from truth or to understand is that truth binds us together in love. Truth is what makes us a community. He says, uh, he goes on, he says, whom I love in the truth. You see, it's in the truth that we come together. It's in, it's in Christ. And then he goes and he says, not I only, but also all who know the truth. That's the second thing he wants you to get, and that is Truth can be known. It's not some abstract notion. It's not some mystery. Uh, it's not a product of different people's feelings or circumstances. Truth is knowable. And then verse 2, he says, because of the truth which lives in us. This is the third thing John wants us to know, is that truth lives in us. It's not from us. All right? it's, and it's the same truth for all of us. Individuals don't get to make it up. And he says, and the truth will be with us forever. See, truth is eternal. It does not change. In verse 3, John tells us what comes in the truth and where the truth comes from. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. Grace, mercy, and peace come in the truth. Grace, mercy, and peace, things that the world desperately seeks in all kinds of remedies but never obtains because it refuses the source. Grace, mercy, peace. And all of it comes from the Father and from Jesus Christ, His Son. That leaves us asking, I mean, these are things that we can know about truth and what John's trying to get across, but really the question is, well, what is truth? <laughs> you know, during his trial, Jesus tells Pilate, he says this, For this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone 
who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. That's what Jesus says. Of course, Pilate responds with the question that many of us ask today. What is truth? What is truth? It's interesting when you, when you read the account that Pilate asks the question and then walks away. Walks away. He quits listening to Jesus. Walks away from truth in the flesh. What is truth? What is truth? We've got to figure that one out. Here's a, here's a good definition. Truth is the character of God. Truth is the character of God. Jesus says in John 14, 6, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus lays it out there. You know, um, Jesus is truth in the flesh. He is the character of God fully revealed. Which is why John says we can know the truth. That's why John says that the truth is eternal and it does not change. That it lives in us. That it makes us a community of love. And that it comes from God and from Jesus. You see, Jesus is the truth. The character of God. Fully revealed. And then John gets into his letter. He gets to the point of what he's going. Here it is, verse 4. He says, It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. What does it mean to walk in the truth? To walk in the truth is to obey God's commands, just as the Father commanded, is what he says. It's to obey His Word. To walk in the truth is to speak, think, and act in ways that correspond to who God is and what He is doing in the world. That's what it means to walk in the truth. Who God is. And what He's doing in the world. You know, God created the universe to work a certain way. I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. He created it to work according to His character. That's the truth. It works. You know, we call this reality. Not, you know, uh, well. Let me give you an analogy here. Maybe this will help. Uh, When driving in the United States, you drive on the right side of the road. Okay, uh, You stop at red lights, you go on green lights. When you do this, driving works for most of us. <laughs> There's a few outliers, but for most of us, it's not a perfect analogy, but you see it. Yeah. When you decide to determine that you're no longer in the United States, but you're now in England... Okay? When you decide, no, this is not the this is not floor. When you get in your car and you say, and you're driving out of here today, and you go, I am now in Manchester, England. And you decide to drive on the left side of the road. Or you determine that, you know, colors are just a social construct meant to keep people trapped in bondage. <laughs> then your driving will kill you and others around you. You see, when the Father gives us commands, like don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, honor your mother and father, have no other gods before me. When He gives these commands, each commandment is an expression of love. Because life works when we, when we go in that direction. In fact, the law is summed up with love. What are the two great commands? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's all, it's all right there. God created us for life, and He desires that we should have it abundantly. But there are those out there that try to make God's commands appear harsh and restricting, and then they offer true freedom. John calls them false teachers. The sexual revolution is a perfect illustration of this. It started out as free love, didn't it? You know, back in the 60s. Because keeping sex inside the covenant of marriage was just too harsh. And we needed to be liberated. So we decided to drive on the other side of the road. In the process, we've wrecked 
families, children, you know, whole communities. And then, of course, the soup we're in now. Are you walking in the truth just as the Father commanded, or are you looking to be set free from a patriarchal religious system from 2,000 years ago that cannot relate to a modern world? John says, I've got great joy because I see some of your children are walking in the truth. Verse 5 and 6, And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. You know, just as we've confused today what truth is, so uh, we are confused today about what love is. And it makes sense that we're confused about both, because truth and love go together. If we get rid of one, we have to counterfeit the other. False teachers today say love is accepting whatever truth a person feels about themselves and affirming that truth. But in order to love someone by that definition, you have to live according to their lie. You have to live according to their deception. And these false teachers are not teaching you how to love. They're teaching you how to be apathetic. Let me show you. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Mm-hmm. Every moment of every day, I'm going to spread my wings and fly away. You're with me, you know? It's my truth. You know? And I want to live out my truth. I should be free to live out my truth. And so I'm going to jump out of a plane. And if you love me, You will affirm my truth. Right? Now, what's the number one command about jumping out of airplanes? No, that's incorrect. The number one command is don't jump out of airplanes. (laughs) The number two command is if you're going to, wear a parachute. Wear a parachute. But you see, a parachute is not affirming of my truth. And according to these false teachers, it's not loving. So you don't say anything to me about it. You don't try and stop me. In fact, uh, you decide you're going to jump with me to show me how much you love me. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, you're going to wear a parachute because flying is my truth, not yours, right? So we climb into the plane and everyone is happy that I finally get to live out my truth. We hug we shed tears because finally I get, to, I get to be who I believe I am. And at 13,000 feet, the door rolls open on the plane and we jump. And I'm flying. I'm, I'm doing rolls. I'm doing a little side to side. Got some spinning action going. Everybody's, in fact, you got your camera and you're brave enough. You actually, we take a selfie <laughs> together. Thumbs up. This is great. I'm flying. And you are so loving to me. You've been with me all the way. All the way. Until you pull your chute. But see, I believe my wings are coming out any second. So I keep on flying. Until the moment I encounter the cold, hard truth of the ground. But that's okay, because at my funeral, you tell everyone that I was true to myself, and now I have my wings. (laughs) Is that love? Friends, Real love walks in obedience to God's commands. Real love rejoices in the truth. Real love treats others the way God treats you. Real love thinks, speaks, and acts in accordance with the character of God and how He created the universe to work. Apathy lives in and affirms lies and deceits. And so John now comes to the warning 
about what's going on in the church. Verse 7, he says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is, is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Woo! That's some, that's some tough language, don't you think? And he doesn't pull any punches here. He's calling it out. You see, this is the I believe in Jesus but warning. You see, it goes like this. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the virgin birth. That's just a little out there. I just don't see how that's possible, so, you know. Or I, I believe in Jesus, but I don't think he said everything that's in the Gospels. I mean, I, you know, no way. No. So I believe in Jesus, but. See, here's what was going on in the first few centuries of the church, there was a teaching that was going around uh, called Gnosticism, and it essentially says that, that Jesus didn't have a body. Because material stuff, body, you see, that's, that's evil. Spirit stuff, spiritual stuff, that's good. And God is good, He's spiritual, therefore He can't have a body because that's bad. You see? Now, that belief throws out the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, all, you know, kind of important stuff. Yeah. Wrong belief leads to wrong action every time. Every time. The belief here and what they struggled with, the belief that the body is evil, took people in one of two directions. Either asceticism, which, which said, you know, you just need to deprive the body. You, you, you just treat it harshly and, and even neglect it. Or it led to the belief that the body uh, was going to disappear, so it didn't matter what you do anyway. Do whatever you want with it. Because it wasn't going to last. God was going to get rid of it anyway. Matter didn't matter. <laughs> You see, these false teachers had begun in the church, but at some point they turned from the truth and began teaching false things. Maybe for money, maybe for celebrity status, maybe in order to take advantage of the church's hospitality. I'm sure many sincerely believed what they were teaching. But just as false, many probably just as much as false teachers do today. But sincerity doesn't make it true. John calls them deceivers and antichrists. You know, false, teacher, false teachers are still in the church today. It's the reason the United Methodist Church is going through a separation. There are many preachers and teachers, even bishops, who deny all kinds of things about Jesus. They believe in Jesus, but... You see? They believe in Jesus, but they believe He is a way to the Father, not the way. They believe in Jesus, uh, you know, the, that He is a truth, not the truth. You know? That He is a life, not the life. You know, you know I, and of course, we should affirm all of these things. All right? Come as you are. Come as you are. Yeah. You know, I could go on, but false teachers like this cause us to lose what we have gained in Jesus Christ. They destroy ministries. They destroy people. You see, this loss has enormous implications. If Jesus is just a way, not the way, the church loses its purpose. It loses, there's no reason to make disciples of Jesus. If He's just a way, just go find another way. If, Jesus is not, if He is a truth, not the truth, why preach Him at all? Why worship Him? Why give Him glory? If Jesus is a life and not the life, then His death meant nothing. And his, we are still lost in our sin with no hope of forgiveness or resurrection or everlasting life. That's why John says in verse 8, Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Watch out. Watch out. Verse 9 gives another warning and a telltale sign of false teachers. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Wow. If I was to read that verse at our annual conference, I would make a lot of friends. Wow. 
John tells us that we are to walk in the truth, that we are to walk in obedience to the Father's commands, that we are to walk in love. Running ahead gets you in trouble. You remember as a kid, you start running around the pool. What happens? Yeah, the lifeguard says, hey, kid, stop running. So what do you do? <laughs> right? You walk fast. Yeah. I was on a, <laughs> I was taking kids hiking uh, one time, and there was a kid who'd never been with us. Uh, his name was Ben. It was. It still is. <laughs> <That's one. laughs> Before we get to there, that could be trouble. Uh, but, you know, Ben, he was a soccer player. He was in great shape, and he was ready to go. I mean, he took off, and he was always in the front of the pack, and it was the first day we're, we're hiking, and uh, Ben uh, didn't like uh, having to stay behind the person who was running point. The person who runs point knows where things are. Here's where the water is. This is where we're going to camp. This is, you know, those kinds of things. Well, Ben, he's just like, man, you guys are slow. You guys, let's go, let's go, go. And so what does he do? Whoop. Choom. He's gone. Now he's loving it. He's, he's having a great old time, right? But I'm running sweep. So I'm in the back and I'm getting the, the stragglers and we finally get to camp. And I look around, no Ben. You know, hey, where's Ben? Oh, he, uh, he got in front of us and he just, uh, I, we think he missed camp. See, camp was off of this little side trail here. The trail went like this. So he never saw where we were going. Didn't know, so he just kept going. I said, well, somebody's got to go get him. <laughs> so I have to run up a mountain, down a mountain, up another mountain before I catch this guy. Like I said, he was in good shape. And I looked at him, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm wondering where everybody is. I'm like, oh. We get back, you know, everybody's like, oh, Ben, he had no idea it was lost. <laughs> running ahead. Oh. False teachers run ahead by going beyond the limits of the Word of God. They say things like, I believe the Bible's inspired, but I believe the Spirit's doing a new thing. Scripture can be useful to us today, but, you know, some parts are out of date and no longer relevant. I hear this all the time. All the time. You know, progressive clergy have progressed too far, and as a result, John says they no longer have God. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible says. You see, John's telling the church that a false teacher is a deceiver, and an antichrist, and does not have God, and now he tells the church what to do or not do about it. Verse 10, he says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Whoa! This is hard stuff, isn't it? I mean, this doesn't appear to be loving at all. It's very exclusive, very narrow. Why is John so hard and adamant about this? Because the truth matters this much. It's a matter of eternal life and death. If the truth, as Jesus says, sets you free, what do you think a lie does? It robs, kills, and destroys. That's what it does. And John here he does not want wolves to come in among the sheep. He does not want to give a false teacher the impression that their heretical uh, teaching is acceptable. Well, it's close enough. It's okay. It'll be fine. We'll just we'll deal with that later. Yeah. See, he knows the truth of what Jesus meant when he said a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Now, I want to be clear, friends. John is not saying that we are only to love, serve, and, and be friends with Christians who pass a theological exam. If that was the case, none of us would be sitting here, right? Right. That's not the point of this one-page wonder. 
Of course, we need to show love and hospitality to those in need. We need to be compassionate to all people, no matter what they believe. His point is to alert the church to false teachers and warn them to keep them out. We must be on our guard, he says. You cannot show hospitality. You cannot do that to false teaching or to false teachers. Don't entertain it. Now clearly, this one-page wonder still hits pretty hard. But that's why it made the book. Because God knows that this issue isn't going away anytime soon. It's been with the church from the beginning. It's why we have most of the New Testament. It's still with us today. And I get that this is tough for some of us. Because you, you may believe differently about truth and love and Jesus and God than what I have preached this morning. So I encourage you to examine what I've said in light of the Scripture. If I've been false, I need to be corrected. I need to repent. But if I've been true to the Word and you disagree, then you need to change your mind. You need to repent. Because the truth is, we both can't be true. If you'd like, I would be more than happy to sit down And talk about this with you face to face. And really, that's exactly how John ends the letter. In verse 12 and 13, he says, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do it on Facebook. (laughs) I don't want to use paper and ink, he says. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greeting. There's a story about John. He has an encounter with a false teacher named Serenthus in Ephesus. He's in a public building, I think a public bathhouse. Serenthus, you see, taught that Jesus was the son of Joseph and Mary. No incarnation, no virgin birth, you know, which has all kinds of huge ramifications. That means that Jesus was not sinless. That his death on the cross does not atone for your sin and my sin. See, where, see the trouble? And so the story goes like this, that they're in this, this building to, and uh, he sees them and John just turns and runs out of the building lest the judgment of God should fall and the building collapse. John does this, why? Because the truth matters that much. You see, it's the truth that sets people free. It is... You don't have to look very far to see what false teaching is doing to families and friends. It's destroying them. It's not love to to pat them on the back and affirm them. Love, Love rejoices in the truth. Love is kind and compassionate. It is patient. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs, but it certainly doesn't live a lie just so that people's feelings aren't hurt. Church, false teaching, it can't be tolerated. This is what John's saying here. Is that what's what's going on in your life? Are you struggling between this truth and love tension? If you are, you're not alone. I'm right there with you. What do we do about it? We cling to the Word. We ask God to pour His Holy Spirit into our lives so that our life would give that truth and love to others. Let's pray together. Father God, sanctify each and every one of us in the truth. Your word is truth. Give us the spirit of truth to live in us and be with us forever that we may walk in obedience to your commands and walk in love. We ask this in the name of the one who is truth and love in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen.